Right. Hello, everybody. My name is Muhammad Ali. Um, this is our webinar on the state of American Muslim civic life 20 years after 9-11. Um, we have with us today, oh, I'm the policy director and uh, here at MPAC, um, also handle the government affairs, government relations portfolio. Uh, today we have with us Sohail Khan. He is the uh, director of external affairs at Microsoft and he's got extensive experience in the federal government. Um, previously was a, a uh, policy advisor in council on Capitol Hill and was a senior political appointee in the Bush administration where he served in the White House and as an advisor for two cabinet secretaries. Um, also, we have Hamid Khan. He's a judicial education attorney with the Federal Judicial Center. Um, he also served as a postdoctoral fellow for Stanford Law's uh, Afghanistan Legal Education Project um, and is currently at the University of Michigan as a uh, professor at law um, and uh, a fellow with the Truman National Security Project. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and uh, uh, Hamid actually has uh, called in. so. You won't get to see his uh, uh, his picture, but we really appreciate you taking the time to do so. Um, so let's let's kick things off. Um, where where were you both on on 9-11, that um, tragic morning? So, Hill, do you want to uh, start? Sure. Well, thanks. Thanks, Mohammed, And thanks to MPAC uh, for organizing this forum. Really uh, honored to be a part of the discussion uh, that, uh, you know, just coming on the 20th anniversary, I've had time to reflect. I was serving in the White House that day. Uh, and curiously enough, the president was scheduled to meet with prominent Muslim American leaders uh, that afternoon at three o'clock, uh, including uh, uh, the leadership from MPAC. Right. Um, so I was uh, uh, hurrying and putting together a memo for the, uh, for the chief of staff, Andy Card, uh, for that three o'clock uh, meeting. Uh, normally the memos are, are are uh, submitted the night before, um, but for a host of reasons, there was not um, enough information to complete the memo, so I was scrambling to do it. When I had drove into work, I had heard that a commuter plane had crashed into uh, the World Trade Center. Like most people, when they first heard the news, I thought it was an accident of some sort. And so I, I was uh, working away, and um, when the fire alarms went off in the White House, I ignored them uh, because we had had a practice drill some months before, and um, in that practice drill, we just I just lost a lot of time in getting work done. And so, thinking um, naively, this was another practice run. I ignored the fire drill, and of course, later uh, learned from a very um, frantic Secret Service agent that this was not a drill that a plane had gone, two planes had gone into the World Trade Center, and that, uh, as he said to me frantically, that a plane was headed towards Washington, D.C., believed to either be going into uh, the White House or the Capitol. We learned subsequently that was Flight 93 that crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Um, so that was a day that um, I remember well, uh, and the, the uh, activities uh, in the days after uh, the, the uh, president, um, uh, or I was part of organizing the National uh, Day of Prayer at the National Cathedral here in Washington, D.C., uh, the visit to the Islamic Center uh, here on Mass Ave in Washington, D.C., the meeting with the Muslim leaders. Uh, unfortunately, that meeting, as I said, at three o'clock was primarily to talk about domestic issues, um, became one that was, uh, you know, the president standing by the Muslim American community to stop uh, any uh, backlash that we knew was already beginning um, and that there were already crimes being targeted against both Muslims and people who are perceived to be Muslims, particularly members of the Sikh faith. Um, and so the president wanted to send a message that while we were gonna take uh, every effort to go after those that uh, killed 3000 innocents uh, in Washington, in New York um, and in Pennsylvania, that we should be careful not to attack our friends and neighbors. Uh, there was uh, the meeting uh, again with several Muslim leaders in the White House uh, and then his address to the uh, joint session of Congress. Uh, and there were just a number of meetings and activities in the wake of 9-11. Um, so that, that those, two, those week or two, I remember um, very vividly, obviously. And I, you know, I lost a dear friend in the plane that uh, uh, was uh, crashed into the Pentagon. And I remember attending her funeral, Barbara Olson. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's kind of the, 
the memories I have from that day, but also from, uh, from the days afterwards. Well, mine were a bit more, far more mundane. I was actually uh, in law school at the time, um, in my third year of law school, and uh, the earliest events of 9-11 transpired uh, in the midst of federal courts. And um, within minutes, uh, the whispers had, had sort of became more and more agitated until it became shouts, and law students, many of whom had friends and relatives, uh, for me, the immediate aftermath was uh, trying to ascertain the fate of individuals that I had worked with at the Pentagon the summer before, where I was uh, in the um, Secretary of Defense's Legal Honors Program and had the privilege of working the Office of General Counsel. And um, in the first in the first hours, uh, especially discovering that the Pentagon had been hit. Uh, it was trying to ascertain the whereabouts of friends and individuals that I had known. Uh, and within hours and, frankly, in subsequent days, um, there were various um, reports throughout the Muslim community, family members, for example, their businesses being uh, having graffiti upon them, individuals verbally assaulting members of the family. So much of what Sahel has already indicated started to happen uh, very quickly. And uh, on the night of 9-11, I received a death threat. Um, uh, it was never clear as to the source of that threat, but it was like everyone else in America, uh, a, sort of a moment in time that uh, I think stands unparalleled and, and one that I remember quite vividly, uh, not only because of the events, but also because of the, of the the silence of not knowing what had happened, what had transpired, and especially in the immediate aftermath. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, it was it was one of the few moments that I think every single American, almost everybody in the world, I imagine, can specifically say what they were doing, where they were, um, and it it it's it's you know one of the transformative moments in in our lives. Um, so one of the things that came out shortly after the attacks was the the invasion of Afghanistan. Another thing that was, um, you know, done relatively quickly was uh, the drafting of the Patriot Act and the passage of the Patriot Act. Um, so, Hale, given your role in the Bush administration at the time, can you speak a little bit more about how that process started? What was the discussion like and what was actually passed? And then what do you think about what happened in implementing the Patriot Act 20 years on? Sure. So as uh, like many things, um, you know, the story doesn't really begin on 9-11 when it comes to the Patriot Act, for example, or for that matter, um, you know, the subsequent uh, global war on terror as, as it has been called now. Um, that effort really started in the wake of the World Trade Center bombing in 1995 um, and many of you remember that uh, Timothy McVeigh, uh, a veteran of the uh, first invasion of Iraq, uh, began uh, to uh, subscribe to you know, various anti-government type of conspiracy theories. He was watching uh, the burning uh, of the uh, facility in Waco, Texas. It was, many, was many, one of many of the individuals who watched the federal agents raid the uh, the, uh, the, you know, the Waco compound and just became, as we now know, radicalized to the point where uh, joining with some others, he engaged in a uh, horrendous massive attack on the federal uh, Murrah building in Oklahoma City, uh, killing, uh, you know, men, women and children in that building. And at that point, I had just started working on Capitol Hill for a member of Congress from the Silicon Valley, a Republican. Um, and also a professor of law at Stanford. And the Counterterrorism Act of 1995 was the proposed legislation uh, brought forward by then President Clinton and Janet Reno, the then uh, sitting attorney general, who essentially said, we need more tools to go after these uh, terrorists. And that means enhanced powers uh, of, for federal law enforcement agencies, including the FBI, and so that legislation uh, was brought forth uh, in both the House and Senate 
uh, as I recall, the sponsor in the House was then Congressman Chuck Schumer. Um, and right away, there was a coalition that formed of Republicans and Democrats. Uh, you know, as, my, as I said, a Republican from Silicon Valley, my boss, Tom Campbell, uh, John Conyers, uh, then the ranking member on the House Judiciary Committee, African-American founder of the Congressional Black Caucus from, from Detroit, Bob Barr, a very conservative class of 94, uh, Republican and a lawyer from Georgia, from the suburbs of Atlanta, and uh, a little known socialist member of Congress from Vermont, Bernie Sanders. And the four of us came together because we had significant concerns, first, second, fourth, fifth amendment concerns about the implementation of then what was called the Counterterrorism Act of 1995. We were able to amend some of those uh, provisions that we thought were particularly onerous. Um, but again, in the fervor and the, and the fear that was pervading in the wake of the 1995 bombing of the federal building, uh, there was a, a real bipartisan push to give President Clinton and law enforcement enhanced powers. Um, so I tell that story because when 9-11 came, law enforcement kind of came around to lawmakers and said, see, we told you so. You didn't give us the powers that we needed then to connect the dots. You didn't give us the powers to communicate with interagency um, on the interagency level and to uh, preemptively go after suspect groups. And now look what happened. And we, we now are asking for those powers. You also had uh, President Bush who was uh, determined not to allow another attack on American soil. Um, and so the Congress acted as it often does in haste uh, to enact uh, what is now known as the Patriot Act that included, again, enhanced powers for federal agencies. And we know some of the provisions, but, uh, and, and I'm sure, you know, Hamid will go through some of those in detail, but the sneak and peek, the roving wiretaps, the uh, monitoring of financial transactions, the enhanced uh, uh, ability to uh, obtain financial records, uh, et cetera, were, uh, were included in that uh, legislation and were not only enacted with full vigor by various law enforcement agencies, but in many cases even uh, transgressed, even, with, even as far as those powers went, uh, and in many cases uh, unconstitutionally, they even went farther in many instances in violating even that law and in violating the individual civil liberties of, of countless Americans across the country. And to this day, we're still um, dealing with the unfolding story of um, I would, what I would argue an overreach by the federal government, particularly when it comes to law enforcement agencies uh, and their ability to police and to, uh, to surveil American citizens. Um, you know, and that's just on the domestic front. Um, we can also discuss first the invasion of, Af Af of Afghanistan, as you mentioned, uh, Mohammed, and then subsequently the invasion of Iraq, which while uh, was not directly tied to 9-11 in any shape or form, was at least, at least emotionally uh, tied in many Americans' minds, including in the lawmakers' minds. And there were many, including, to be fair, in the Bush administration, who tried to blur that line uh, to cause um, the, the uh, to justify the invasion of Iraq when we all know that uh, Iraq had nothing to do with the invasion uh, that occurred on our soil on September 11th. But, uh, you know, history is what it is. And, um, those, those two wars began. And then, of course, there were other uh, uh, wars around the globe that were not even named, where people were arrested, uh, uh, interrogated, uh, and, and brought to places like Guantanamo. And again, we're, we're still dealing with that unfolding uh, legacy uh, of, uh, of what is now known as the global war on terror. You know, it's interesting you mentioned um, the, uh, the fact um, you know how, how surveillance it, it it perhaps was overly intrusive and maybe didn't accomplish some of the things that it, or or was not uh, not completely able to do what it was was intended to do. Um, Salam Al Mariyati, who is the president of MPAC, actually sat down with um, the the top counterterrorism official um, at uh, the Department of Homeland Security's uh, John Cohen, and he was also talking about the secure the the, the counterterrorism apparatus if it is done 
poorly, it can result in, you know, making us less safe than what in what is uh, sort of intended to do. Um, Hamid, you uh, you had also worked at uh, ODNI, correct? The Office of uh, the Director of Intelligence. I mean, do we still have you? So I, I was just wondering from Hamid's perspective, given that he has that background and ODNI was um, a result of, you know, some of the post 9-11 uh, restructuring of our intelligence committee. So I wanted to get his perspective on, on that. But while we are waiting to get him back online, I'll continue on with a couple of questions for you, Sahil, that I wanted to um, get your perspective on. So what what impact has the has had the Patriot Act had on on American Muslims in terms of, you know, obviously the way that they are surveilled, but also just their perception of how the government, the federal government, treats them? And does is, has that been something where you feel like they have become more engaged to protect their rights and reputation as you know citizens of the U.S. and Americans, or has that made it so that they are less likely to engage? Where sort of like where is the um, the state of American Muslim life as a result of the Patriot Act, as a result of the war uh, in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. Just your your thoughts on, on that. Well, that's a PhD dissertation in of itself, but I'll try right. to give some top line thoughts. It's kind um, of your, yeah, top line thoughts. Yeah. So, you know, first of all, um, the, you know, the, the first thing, of course, is that inevitably every Muslim became regarded as a suspect. Uh, and even though you know, I would say that the president uh, tried uh, to discriminate between, you know, those that attacked us and the average American Muslim, as he articulated, was loyal and, you know, uh, tried to differentiate between the, the, the religion of Islam and the way it's practiced. And again, what the hijackers did and the terrorists did to kill innocents. Again, in, in you know, we are emotional creatures uh, and um, in many people's minds, that was still, uh, you know, conflated. And and let's be fair, there were many, particularly in Washington D.C., who were deliberately trying to uh, foment uh, anti-Muslim sentiment. Uh, and now they had, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a major uh, uh, talking point to make. Um, and that 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 was, you know, and then we had, of course, we can't be ignored that we had a rash of subsequent. Uh, domestic terrorist attacks uh, across yeah. the country, uh, San Bernardino, Chattanooga, Lackawanna, and so many other places where there were plots or outright attacks to kill innocents uh, um, many times in the name of Islam. Um, and so these, these, this, that, that targeting of the Muslim community, the Muslim American community uh, was robust and continues to be a challenge. Uh, the second is even from a well-meaning perspective, law enforcement and government agencies in their well-meaning uh, uh, desire to engage with Muslim American and Muslim American communities, that engagement was what is often called a securitized uh, basis, that the only thing they wanted to talk about was how do we get and stop radicalization? How do we get anybody within the community who wants to do uh, innocence harm and stop them, which is important and needed, um, but that can't be the only basis for the relationship that a citizen has with their government and with government agencies. But for many years, under several administrations, that was the underlying plank of the relationship. Yeah, and, it's, and definitely, it's definitely a bipartisan, bipartisan thing where a lot of Muslim Amer American Muslims feel like they are viewed through the, le the, the, the prism and the lens of intelligence. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, your background having been on Capitol Hill as an advisor during uh, as a you know kind of after um, the Oklahoma City bombings which was sort of the beginning of the process to kind of come up to what the Patriot Act uh, sought to accomplish. ODNI, DOJ, the uh, Justice Department, um, Department of Homeland Security have all now identified and have for some time that the greatest threat that the, uh, that, uh, that the United States faces is from uh, white supremacist violence and domestic terrorism. We um, actually, MPAC recently released uh, a report kind of speaking to that and the disparity between uh, the prosecution of uh, domestic terrorism versus the designation of foreign terrorists. Why is it, do you think, that despite the intel community saying that the greatest threat to the American homeland 
is or are, are white supremacists is domestic terrorism. However, there is a disparity between the resources devoted to the prosecution um, of of those folks. Why is there a disparity between that? And 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 um, well, I, I think, and, and just I think we also have uh, Hamid back online. Oh, so okay. if yeah, if you can, uh, Hamid, if you can also speak to your background working at um, ODNI. And, um, you know, which also, like I was saying um, earlier, like the Patriot Act was one of the things that to um, allow for better communication between the intelligence uh, agencies. Um, can, can you speak to a little bit of your time there? And also, we were just talking about how, um, right. you know, the, the, the Departments of Justice, Homeland Security, um, in ODI as well, have identified domestic terrorists, white uh, uh, supremacist to be the greatest threat to the American homeland. Well, what's interesting is that um, my involvement with the Office of, of the Director of National Intelligence was um, actually looking forward uh, for the what was then to be the incoming Trump administration uh, to sort of give uh, some insight into global trends that were going on, and that was that was uh, a product of the work that I had done abroad. Uh, on behalf of various agencies of the U.S. government. But to your point, and I think to, to the, the point raised earlier uh, regarding this whole maelstrom of, of a security apparatus and the whole discussion, one of the things that I was, sort of privileged, I was both privileged and, and weighted down with was uh, working on uh, the Gitmo cases as a counsel uh, for six detainees held at Guantanamo Bay. Um, and through various pro bono efforts by my uh, then law firm, uh, we were able to get one individual uh, who was declared a non enemy combatant uh, transferred to a third country. But I will, I will suggest that um, the, we encountered incredible difficulty um, in terms of being able to ascertain information, being able to ascertain uh, the, those who were detained, even their correct names. Uh, at every turn, we were stonewalled by uh, individuals at the at the Department of Defense. And what was curious about all of this is that just immediately prior to my time working on the Gitmo cases, I was an assistant U.S. attorney in uh, in Denver, Colorado. So I had sort of this flip situation where I had worked for the government um, uh, on uh, unrelated matters, and then suddenly. I was posed to oppose the government uh, in in these cases, uh, but suffice it to say, you know, to the larger extent to which security and intelligence um, became an issue, I had to undergo uh, various um, qualifications in order to be counsel. And then once I became counsel, uh, there was a, an effort by some officials to black blackball. Uh, lawyers who had represented detainees, both on the private level, but there were some efforts, even, uh, you know, some had said that it came all the way from different parts of government. So I can say that front and center, despite my involvement and despite uh, all of my background in government, uh, I immediately became suspicious both for the work I was doing and, and, uh, and uh, the reasons for doing it. You know, that's interesting. You bring that up. So how actually, um, this is a question that I think that perhaps both of you guys can speak to. Uh, Hamid, from the perspective of having represented uh, detainees and the resulting backlash, and um, uh, uh, so Hale, from your perspective of being um, a Muslim and a Republican and in the administration, like what kind of, what, when you share those experiences with, with folks, what is the reaction like? What do they say? As far as the overreach? Well, no, no, no. I'm saying it's just being a Muslim staffer in the White House during 9-11 um, and, and, and being a Republican. And from Hamid, your perspective of like when you are, um, you know, looking for jobs or trying to kind of coordinate the professional spectrum, uh, you know, being somebody who has detain, uh, who has represented detainees, what is the reaction that you get? Or does that, do you feel like it continues to hinder? And then, uh, so he'll just kind of like, I, yeah, out of curiosity and just kind of what is the reaction when, when, when people hear that? And, you know, what was your role in um, sort of the, the, the Patriot Act creation and all of that? Just, you know, so hell, if you want to start and then if you want to oh, jump sure. in. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 
so I didn't have any role in the creation of the Patriot Act. That was something that came mainly out of justice, uh, main justice. Um, but I was somebody who, you know, within the White House and throughout the administration um, was making every effort to bring people in from uh, various groups to raise concerns, uh, to, to bring uh, not just legal uh, concerns, but real world experience concerns about overreach uh, and challenges and to, you know, help inform law enforcement uh, on that, that fine line of, of trying to uh, protect the homeland, trying to protect us from, from attack and from harm, but also in balancing the civil rights and civil liberties of, of, um, of uh, Americans. So that was something that I engaged in, in you know, throughout the Bush administration. Um, and some of those were successful and some of those efforts, you know, took as, as Hamid articulated was very, a very, a very heavy lift. Uh, because again, law enforcement, by its general culture and ethos, um, you know, can often just bring up the worst uh, examples. And in this case, we had uh, 3,000 people that were murdered. Uh, uh, you know, and again, the feeling was we needed we need to stop this from happening again. And and um, and there were subs again there were subsequent attacks. Uh, not uh, thankfully not to the the size and scope of, uh, of 9-11, but there were, were several attempts both here and abroad of, of uh, individuals and groups engaged in terrorism. So that was, that was part of the process of trying to inform law enforcement and lawmakers and other decision makers about the real world consequences of some of these uh, law enforcement overreaches to the earlier point. You know, again, I mean, when it comes to intelligence gathering, there's something about finding the needle in the haystack, but there is also something about enlarging the haystack uh, and that's what I would argue um, in many cases happened, that the haystack was uh, unreasonably and unrealistically enlarged and to the point where we were, uh, you know, we as a country were not able to, to find uh, all the, the needles because we were just looking at too much information. And, and, in, and in many cases, people were looking at the wrong information or they were not informed uh, about, you know, the nuances of various communities. Um, in the country and around the globe. And so there were, it just, to me, emphasizes a couple things. First, Americans of all backgrounds need to continue to engage with their government, to engage in the democratic process. And two, that we need good people, uh, informed and thoughtful people to serve in government, uh, both in appointed and elected office. Um, because in many cases, uh, the overreaches were not done because of... Um, uh, an intention to harm, but, but but came from a place of ignorance uh, and a, a place of just a lack of knowledge. And because there weren't people with knowledge in the room, bad decisions were being made. To your last point, as far as you know, being uh, a, a Republican and and a Muslim in a re that was never an issue. Uh, I've always been very much welcomed and, and celebrated within uh, the party, but also the conservative movement uh, by movement conservatives. And so that's something that I. You know, while it was it was a day of great sadness and, and days after uh, the attack on 9-11, um, you know, there was something to be said of fellow Americans, uh, you know, gathering around and trying to help uh, other Americans uh, and support them through this tough process, including when there were some who did attack me because of my Muslim faith, not uh, within the party, but from people, you know, on the Internet uh, and other places that did attack me, uh, you know, I did have death threats, but it was, uh, you know, again, my fellow conservatives that came uh, to my stand, uh, side and, and stood by me, and even strangers that I didn't know from across the country who said, hey, we're with you, what can we do to help? Yeah, I've, I've read about the, the support that you received after all of it, and, and so that, that was endearing to hear. And it's interesting you mentioned the fact that having a relationship and being in the room where decisions are being made, and it, it makes the whole process better. I know at MPAC, we engage quite a bit with the Department of Homeland Security, the relevant committees on Capitol Hill. And one of the things that we hear over and over again is that they want our perspective. They want to hear what are American Muslims feeling? What are they thinking? How does it impact their community? So I really appreciate you mentioning that and sharing that perspective because every time we engage with uh, Capitol Hill and the administration, that's exactly what we're hearing over and over again. Um, and um, I'll kick it over to uh, Hamid to talk about your uh, the, the response that you get or sort of, you know, what, what has been the impact of, um, you know, representing Guantanamo detainees? Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting because um, uh, I grew up in probably the most 
one of the more conservative states in the country. I grew up in rural Wyoming, and being part of the mo- first Muslim family there uh, gives you sort of an instant level of credibility with all circles. But uh, that was put to the test um, when you were front-facing and, and representing detainees uh, at Gitmo. And I remember being confronted by uh, a Navy midshipman who was at the base. And he, as he was transporting uh, a fellow attorney and myself around the base, he had mentioned to me, well, we know what you guys really want to do. You want to set these guys free. Uh, and we, and we had sort of, it, it never really, it never really became very crystallized in that moment. But what we were really were, were about and what we remain was adhering to the idea that the rule of law is, is more important than any one person, than any one administration, uh, and that it was beyond any one individual. And it was that vantage point and, and the point that Sayal makes uh, earlier about leveraging uh, Muslim communities and Muslims in particular to serve in government, to serve uh, and to leverage their knowledge, their passion and their backgrounds uh, to serve a greater cause. And a few years later, I would find myself in Afghanistan uh, helping to build the first legal studies program at the American University there and subsequently serve as an advisor to the U.S. government trying to work on issues uh, that were particularly salient to uh, uh, to Afghanistan, but leveraging my knowledge and understanding of Islam, Islamic history, cultural sensitivities, and then the nuances that came with understanding matters like Islamic law and Islamic constitutionalism and, and even uh, creating uh, some programs that were still meeting the aims of the U.S. government, specifically in Afghanistan, but doing it through uh, ways in which uh, were consistent with um, Islamic law and Islamic ethos and the Islamic values. So in some respects, uh, what, what I found or what I was encouraged to find uh, by my counterparts in government and those uh, who I worked with was it opened a whole new level of understanding because frankly, um, as, as I think I mentioned in a conversation previously, sometimes uh, we assume that everyone has a similar degree of understanding, but cultural competence, historical competence, and a willingness to leverage uh, all of those aspects of our identity, not only serves to our own communities, but can also serve uh, communities abroad. And in this case, um, what what was potentially a weakness, what was a critique, uh, actually became advantageous and was sought after. And thereafter, for me, um, I was brought in by the State Department, by other agencies of the U.S. government to bring to bear the knowledge and cultural competence uh, that I had working throughout the Muslim world, not just Afghanistan, but in places sure. like Libya and places like Pakistan. Uh, so. Time. Sounds like wonderful experience, and I'm sure you were able to, um, you know, enrich the process. And you know, related to the Guantanamo uh, conversation that we were just uh, we were mentioning, um, MPEC actually did a webinar um, with uh, an individual um, whose story was featured in a movie called The Mauritanian. So, um, if you guys want to mm-hmm. check that out, kind of talking about the need to to, to close that. Um, we have we have a question from uh, the the audience, and I'll just read it aloud. Do you think all that the current uh, excessive media coverage of the 20 year commemoration of 9-11 and showing the tragic images of that day may return anti-Muslim bias and hate? And if they do, what can Muslims in the USA do to address both? So, I mean, what, I, I guess I could just rephrase that by saying that, what impact do you think that as we kind of look back at the imagery, what impact does that have on American Muslim life? Well, I'll, I'll just say, you know, to me, I don't think it was excessive. Um, it was something that I think was, you know, an important uh, moment, uh, a, a tragedy, a, an amazingly tragic uh, day. Um, and so 20 years on, um, you know, I, I didn't think the coverage and the remembrances and the commemorations made by, uh, you know, various government officials and the president was um, unwarranted. Um, you know, again, I, I lost a dear friend um, in that attack, and uh, we lost 3,000 people um, uh, that deserve to live their lives fully. And I, but I will say that um, there's no reason why we can't be thoughtful 
and, and, and contemplative when it comes to that remembrance, uh, to learn the lessons um, that now in hindsight are be, have become quite obvious. You know, even this discussion to this day, I think is part of that reflection um, to say, yes, we were attacked. Yes, those who attacked us deserve to be brought to justice, um, but that we should not engage in overreach, that we should not vilify innocent uh, communities with the broad brush, uh, that we should be careful when granting uh, government uh, excessive powers to engage in surveillance and uh, invasions of privacy uh, and worse, uh, you know, arrest and detentions of individuals. Um, that in, in the end, uh, as Hamid uh, reflected, we are a country that adheres to a rule of law that is constitutionally based uh, when it comes to the engagement of the wars uh, and the, the, the very tragic ending of uh, the U.S. Uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan, no matter how you felt about that war, about the loss of innocent lives in both Afghanistan and Iraq, what, how those wars occurred, what happened there, the missions, um, those are things that I think we should continue to reflect upon, learn from. And then from a, specifically from Muslim American perspective, first, you know, again, what's forgotten is that many Muslim Americans were murdered on 9-11 in the towers, uh, and that many Muslim Americans uh, served both as firefighters and, and as New York uh, City police officers to, uh, to rush in to help their fellow Americans. And, and since, as Hamid has already uh, articulated, have served uh, heroically in some of the more uh, difficult places around the globe to continue to keep Americans and others safe. And so that to me is part of the legacy, part of the commemoration of 9-11. Uh, and it's up to us to make that a part of the legacy of 9-11 uh, as we continue to reflect on what happened that day and, and in the 20 years subsequently. I, I think that one of the sort of takeaways uh, from from the question is a, a growing concern. And I think, frankly, that concern um, has, has transformed a, a bit from some of the uh, the anti-Muslim sentiments, and over the over the past 20 years, we've seen now um, a sentiment that has turned uh, against immigrants, uh, sentiment that is posing questions from a political perspective uh, that have put Muslims on edge. And I don't think that there is, well, there's probably not a definitive line. Certainly, there is a through line between. Uh, the remembrances of 9-11, the connection that is often mislabeled to ISIS, and then more currently, concerns being raised in however sporadic ways and hopefully uh, not in a persistent way with regard to uh, many of the Afghan allies that we made promises to and that we should uh, in endeavor to keep. Uh, at the same time, you still see the specter by uh, certain individuals that give rise to concerns. And it cannot be forgotten that those concerns uh, remain in, the, in many people's mindsets, whether fair or not. At the same time, I, will, I, I also uh, am heartened by what we saw on Newsweek, what we've seen by the Muslim community and, and frankly, their forthrightness, uh, which probably began uh, with 9-11 and has continued since, to stand on their own two feet, to articulate their various voices, and to be willing to um, assert their self, assert their identity, but more importantly, be proud of that identity in a way that gives them and galvanizes them in a courtroom, in their communities, in their schools, and uh, even in the public sphere, as well as on television. So, um, I, I think that you know, I think that to the question. I think the most important thing for us to all to remember is that one, we as as Muslims stand together. We we share our communities with everyone else as part of this ethos about being American, and being American and being who we are means that we stand for what we believe. We assert our identity proudly and civilly, and and I think we should continue to do so, whatever the political machinations m might be, whether it's the 20-year anniversary of 9/11 or any other onslaught. Uh, upon people's rights or their dignity. I would 100% I would agree with Hamid on that. You know, I, I've thought about these issues, uh, you know, greatly even before 9-11, just kind of how the American Muslim community continues to navigate, um, you know, our, our, our place and our, our 
citizenship as as proud Americans. And uh, you know, I, I had an opportunity, as as Mohammed said in the introduction, to serve um, Cabinet Secretary Norman Mineta, who happened to be Japanese American, who was locked up for three and a half years because he was of Japanese ancestry uh, by President Roosevelt during World War II. Uh, and, 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 and Hamid will appreciate, was locked up in, in Cody, Wyoming, where my parents also mm -hmm. went to school in Laramie uh, in the mid-60s, um, and came out and made a decision, you know, um, that he was going to, uh, you know, serve in, in the military, serve in public service, become a mayor of a, a major city in California, and then a congressman, and then to serve in two cabinets, uh, both under President Clinton and President Bush, as a proud American. That is, you know, and, and, and in discussing with him many times the um, the plight of the American Muslim community post 9-11 and the persecution that we were facing, uh, not only at the hands of law enforcement, but at the hands of fellow citizens, misguided and ignorant fellow citizens. You know, one of the things that we talked about a great degree was that the American Muslim community, particularly after 9-11, but even to this day, was at the intersection of the experience of kind of two previous communities who likewise had to navigate through the often difficult waters of what it means to be an American. The first being the Catholic community, Irish and Italian Americans, others who are suspect, somehow were accused of being loyal to the Pope and not to the United States. We all remember in 1960, when then Kennedy had to exactly address that anti-Catholic sentiment head on. Uh, and then uh, the Japanese American community, of course, which um, Mr. Mineta is one, where he said, you know, we, as in his case, a, 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 a Japanese American living in San Jose, California, was some, somehow associated with the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. And so the Muslim American community is, is, is at that intersection of suspicion and fear and, and hate. And that's, uh, as Hamid articulated so eloquently, we have to continue to navigate those waters proudly, strongly, and boldly. I will say to one of the questions that was raised in the chat, um, Muslim women, are oftentimes on the front lines of that of that engagement because many cases, you know, we as Muslim men can kind of blend in, but Muslim mm -hmm. women, particularly those that uh, choose to wear hijab, are right on the front lines and are visible uh, as Muslims and oftentimes the the uh, the subject and oftentimes the victims of of tremendous uh, hate and and uh, and suspicion and fear from our fellow Americans. And so I definitely want to mention that that is something that. Um, you know, as a man, I can't necessarily uh, 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 feel, but I can at least appreciate that uh, people like my sisters and my, my mother and others, uh, Muslim women, uh, have been on that front line. And I'm proud that uh, we continue to see, as uh, Hamid articulated, Muslim women and men uh, continuing to strive and to succeed uh, throughout the American um, society, whether it's in, in government, in, in, uh, in uh, entertainment, and sports and so many other facets of American life. Yeah, that's something that impact. We definitely, um, you know, in addition to you know, the policy work that we do, we also kind of try to engage uh, in the entertainment side with our Hollywood Bureau, which tries to kind of con connect Muslim Americans who are American Muslims who are kind of in the speech writing or the, the screenwriting stage. So th that leads me to my next question. And that is, uh, so, Hill, you were, uh, you know, you were professionally, you were working in the uh, in the House of Representatives uh, pre 9/11, um, and Hamid, you you were in law school, like you said. What do you? Th I mean, the generation, you know, after uh, the after the attacks, you know, people who were, you know, just kids back then. What impact do you think that that has had on their desire to kind of represent or to kind of engage with the government, go into roles? in the public sector, whether it is local, state, federal, is that, is, has that been sort of the impetus behind that? Or has that been something where because of the reaction to the American Muslim community, they're less likely to? I would suggest, um, you know, I, I was a product of, of that sort of generation. And I, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't say it uh, any other way that 9-11 definitely changed the trajectory of my career. Um, in terms of what I anticipated and where uh, where I end up going, but um, you know, I, I think that I have never been more proud of a community that has become so engaged on so many different levels on on a level of activism, on elected uh, elected government, but beyond. Um, you know, I'm I'm proud to be within a, 
a group of uh, Muslim American public servants, uh, and I was one, I was the first one of the first Muslims that were recognized as a Truman Scholar for a career dedicated to public service as a as an honor to um, one of our earlier presidents. And what I've been absolutely heartened by and amazed is the wherewithal of the Muslim community to be in every sector of our communities. Uh, and I think 9-11 was an important uh, turning point, I think, but it also, as I said, galvanized people's strength. It gave them the steel in their spine to stand up. And they realized, I think many Muslims uh, of every stripe have realized that um, if, not, if not now, then when? And we have now built I think a generation, or nearly a generation from 9-11, uh, an even more eager and attuned Muslim population that is more willing to engage, uh, not less. I'll agree with that. Um, you know, again, <laughs> uh, Hamid speaks exactly uh, the truth there. Uh, you know, I'll say my experience was a little different. I came to Capitol Hill um, you know, I was the only Muslim staffer on the Hill at the time. Uh, to my history, uh, to my knowledge, I was the second Muslim to serve on Capitol Hill. Um, Khalil Munir was the first, uh, but he had left by the time I got there. Um, but I didn't come there as a Muslim American. I came there as a Reagan, uh, somebody who was inspired by the Reagan revolution, uh, who wanted to shrink government, you know, cut taxes, empower individuals to make their own decisions in their lives. And uh, I was, a, you know, that's what I, you know, I came to Washington, D.C. to to really improve the lives of my fellow Americans, regardless of their background or stripe or ethnic or religious backgrounds. Um, but then of course, um, when I saw legislation that was gonna directly impact uh, the Muslim American community, and particularly in a negative way, uh, and other communities that should be pointed out, uh, when I saw that decisions were being made uh, in the administration that I served in, that again, we're gonna have negative impacts there, as I said before, you know, it was, uh, as Hamid articulated, it was incumbent upon me to stand up and say, hey, you know, we're making a mistake here, or we should think about this in a different way, or this provision of this bill just needs to be cut out and, and thrown away. Um, you know, and again, because we are a government of the people, uh, each of us bring a different perspective uh, and experience to that decision making process. And, uh, you know, I'll have to say, my parents were very much against me coming to Washington, D.C., against me working on Capitol Hill. They had visions of Watergate and corruption, and uh, so they were very nervous about uh, my engagement in the political arena. But as I said, the first bill that was on my desk, I still remember to this day, the Counterterrorism Act of 1995, and all the provisions that were so harsh and critical and, and were, um, you know, potentially going to be harming the Muslim American community. Uh, we later, you know, President Clinton arrested 24 Muslims and held them without charge and without access to the evidence uh, was then called secret evidence. You know, then my parents came around and said, hey, it is important for Muslim Americans to be at the table, to be in those conferences, to uh, conference rooms, to be informing those decisions uh, because, you know, as, as often said in Washington, DC, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Uh, and so they had a 180 degree change of heart. And I think the community in many ways has had that change of heart when it comes to engagement, that we, like our fellow Americans, have every right to have a say when it comes to the future of our lives and our communities and our country. And in many cases, it's incumbent upon us to stand up and stand up not only for our personal rights, but for the rights of others, um, because that's not only something that we should do as loyal and proud Americans, but in, indeed as Muslims, that is incumbent on us from a religious perspective. And so I think that's happening more and more what I'm very, very excited that's happening now is that Muslims are not alone, that we've been joined by our Christian, Jewish, and other friends from other faith communities uh, that have come to stand with us when it comes to fighting for uh, the rights of the many and the few. Uh, and that is something that gives me continued heart. Again, going back, you know, each community has had to navigate their place in the American society. The American Muslim navigation has been a bumpy one. If you even look back to the days of, of Cassius Clay becoming Mahon Ali in the 60s and, and, and refusing to draft. Uh, and we continue to have uh, those challenges, but I'm confident as have previous American communities that we will uh, continue to uh, thrive uh, in the American society as full-fledged Americans.
So you brought up the idea or the, you know, what happened to um, uh, Secretary Mineta and the experience that he had where he was interned. And we have examples of the way that American Muslims have been treated, though they weren't interned. Um, and so, you know, what what needs to be done or improve or what lessons have we learned um, from all of these minority communities going back, you know, over a, you know, a century or so ago? So in, to ensure that, you know, whoever the next minority group is or the current minorities that are in this country, that they are treated with a degree of respect that their predecessors have not. The first thing I would say is persist as a community. I mean, Thuel raises the point of Cassius Clay and his is obviously a notable example. I point to the example of my uncle who came to the United States uh, at the turn of the century, and as I, as I mentioned earlier, settled in Wyoming of all places. What was interesting about his experience is that uh, many of the people who spoke about him, people like Jerry Spence and other notable figures who had crossed paths, didn't know his ethnicity, but, but it was later turned out that, that uh, he was stripped of his citizenship because he wasn't sufficiently white enough. Uh, he later regained his uh, citizenship and uh, but he persisted. He persisted as an entrepreneur. He persisted as a, as a father. Um, and he, he enjoyed the benefits of both the benefits of living in, in the United States, generations removed. I think that uh, we have come of age in terms of a better sense of our identity. We are the most diverse Muslim community in the world with an unparalleled level of um, uh, educational background, but also uh, mobility and, uh, you know, we're, we're far afield in terms of different career tra trajectories. I think what those, have, what those lessons have taught us is to show a degree and a level of empathy for all communities that um, are under the gaze of others, to be willing to stand together uh, when others are um, being not necessarily persecuted, but under the uh, under the knife's edge in terms of what the latest trend might be. Uh, and then also realize that coalition building, like many efforts in civil rights and, and every human rights discourse, is absolutely important to know and to strategize, to be willing to um, to make sacrifices. But again, I think at the at a minimum, it is our persistence that has kept us uh, kept us here and has basically created a great deal of advantages for us as a community. Yeah, that's very insightful. Um, you know, we're coming up uh, at the end of our time. I just wanted to ask if uh, either of you have any final thoughts that you wanted to share that we haven't had a chance to touch on or, you know, anything else that you wanted to share. I was just going to say one one thing that I thought was particularly important uh, is uh, the role of Muslim women, and and Sohail pointed it out. I, I think that that role that role of Muslim women wearing the hijab is something that I encounter. It's something that I encounter on a personal level with my wife, but also with my three daughters, uh, and it's always very interesting to see. Um, how many people can navigate the, 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 the pronunciation of their names and their familiarity. And what I have found on a microcosmic level is that in some ways they are the, they are the front facing ambassadors of the Muslim community because both by their name, by their manner, by wearing the hijab uh, and by their personification, uh, they demonstrate, I think to a lot of people uh, what, what the Muslim community is composed of. And so, I just wanted to give a shout out to uh, to that point raised earlier. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks um, for, thank you for bringing that up. Um, what was there anything else that you wanted to add, Sale? No, no, just just saying thank you, and I agree one hundred percent. Yeah, well, let's keep this conversation going. Let's continue to utilize one another. Um, you both, you know, in your case, Sohel, like you mentioned, you're a pioneer in this space, and you both are sort of pillars of the community and role models. And, you know, for my, you know, personally and from MPAC and from our audience, I really appreciate your time and your, uh, your, your expertise and just generally what you have done for American Muslims. Well, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Take care.